Oh, good afternoon, congregation. What a privilege it is to be in God's house this afternoon. We welcome all of you who are gathered here together to this worship service, also the people that are watching from home. This is a special service in which you may install new office bearers into their respective offices. May the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be uplifted also this afternoon. Our call to worship comes to us from the book of Psalms, Psalm 107, verse 1, where we read, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let us respond by singing Psalter 292, stanzas 1 and 5. 292, 1 and 5. Congregation, the Lord has again called us to worship Him, and we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps truth, lives forever, and never forsakes the works of His own hands. Amen. Receive the greeting of the Lord, grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing in praise to God from Psalter number 368. 368, Arise, O Lord our God, arise and enter now into thy rest. 368, all five stanzas.
Let us read together from God's holy word from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. In our Pew Bibles, page 1045. Colossians 1, we'll read the entire chapter, and our text will be verses 28 and 29, the last two verses of the chapter. Let us hear together the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long suffering, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist." And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. This time we want to move to the installation of the new elders and deacon in our congregation. I invite you to turn in these little booklets again to page 17. Page 17.
Before we read this form, let me uh, acknowledge on behalf of the consistory and congregation the service of Brian and Klaus and Roger and Adam as elders and Eric as deacon, the office bearers who are outgoing, and we want to acknowledge your service and give thanks for the Lord enabling you to serve the last number of years among us. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of what Paul writes to Timothy when he talks about the deacons who serve well, 1 Timothy 3, and the elders who rule well, 1 Timothy 5. And we give thanks to God for all of you men who have served and may say that God has enabled you to serve well. And we give Him praise for that and pray now also a blessing on your time of rest and your service in other areas of work. We move now to the installation of new office bearers, and starting on page 17, Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the consistory has made known to you the names of our brothers here present who were chosen to the offices of elders and deacon in this church. They indicate their full agreement with our confessions by signing the form of subscription, and that happened, by the way, just prior to this service in the consistory room. And since there were no lawful objections received, we shall proceed to their installation in the name of the Lord. Let us listen to what the Word of God teaches regarding these offices. The office of elder is based on the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when He ascended, left His church in the world and provided it with officers who should serve and rule in His name. The term elder, or eldest, comes from the Old Testament and refers to a person who is placed in an honorable office of government over others. We read in Acts 14.23 that elders were appointed in every church. And in his letter to Timothy, Paul commands those who rule well to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Paul distinguishes here between the elders who labor, particularly in the ministry of the word and sacraments, and those who are responsible for the oversight of the church, together with the ministers of the word. The apostle also speaks of ruling with diligence and gifts of administration. It is also fitting that such men should be joined to the ministers of the word in the government of the church, so that thereby all tyranny and lording may be kept out of the church of God, which more easily creeps in when government is placed in the hands of only one or a few. The work of the elders is to provide oversight in the name of the ascended king, and as servants of the great shepherd caring for his flock. It is also the duty of the elders to maintain the purity of the word and sacraments, to uphold the good order of the church, carefully guarding the sacredness of the offices, and faithfully exercising discipline. They should lovingly and humbly promote the faithful exercise of the office by their fellow officers. They should serve all Christians with advice and comfort. They should especially oversee the doctrine and life of the minister of the word, so that the church may show itself to be the pillar and ground of the truth, be edified and see to it that no strange doctrine be taught. The apostle exhorts elders to watch diligently against the wolves which may come into the sheepfold of Christ. As such, the elders should diligently search the word of God and continually meditate on the mysteries of faith, and in so doing, keep careful watch over one's own soul. To fill such a sacred office honorably, the elders should set an example of godliness in their personal life, in their home life, and in their relations with their fellow men. Walking thus in all godliness and faithfully discharging their office, when the chief shepherd appears, they will receive the unfading crown of glory. The office of deacon is based upon the love and concern of Christ for his own. This concern is so great that he considers what is done to, the, to one of the least of his brothers as done to him. In this way, our Lord identifies the needy as his representatives in our expression of compassion and benevolent service on earth. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. According to Acts 6, the apostles themselves ministered to the needy in the beginning. Afterward, when they were overburdened with this service, to the extent that some were neglected, certain men were chosen for this ministry, leaving the apostles to continue steadfastly in prayer and in the ministry of the Word. Since that time, the church has recognized this service as a distinct office. The work of the deacons in the first place consists in the faithful and diligent gathering of the offerings which God's people in gratitude make to their Lord for the poor. Secondly, it involves the humble, cheerful, and wise distribution of gifts according to need with kind deeds and words of comfort and encouragement from Scripture. To fill such a sacred office worthily, 
The deacons should set an example of godliness in their personal life, in their home life, and in their relations with their fellow men, thus conducting themselves as worthy representatives of Christ's loving care and faithfully ministering in His name to those who are the beloved of God. They gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This time it's, I would like to ask you five brothers to rise for the questions. Brothers, in order that the church may hear that you are willing to take up your office as described, please answer the following questions. First, are you elders and deacon convinced in your heart that you are lawfully called by God's church and therefore by God himself to your respective holy offices? Second, do you believe the Old and New Testament to be the only infallible Word of God and the doctrinal standards of this church to be in complete harmony with it, and do you reject all doctrines repugnant to it? Third, having heard the description of the purpose and requirements of these offices, do you promise to fulfill them faithfully by the grace of God? You elders and the government of the church, together with the ministers of the Word, and as deacon in serving the needy. And fourth, do you promise to walk in all godliness and to submit to the government and admonition of the church in all things pertaining to your office? What is your answer, Dave Tamminger? Matt Lau. Kevin DeFries? John Vanderman? Chris Niebuhr? Brothers, may our Almighty God and Father fill you with His grace that you may faithfully and fruitfully discharge your respective office, offices. Amen. Congregation, let's stand to sing together with these five brothers. Psalter number 421. 421, and we will sing stanza 4 and 5. 421, 4 and 5, and let's stand to sing. Continuing on with the form, you are charged, elders, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be diligent in the government of the church, which is committed to you with the minister of the word. Be faithful watchmen over the house of God, both to encourage and to admonish, taking heed that purity of doctrine and godliness of life be maintained. 
You are charged, deacon, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be diligent in receiving the gifts of God's people, wise and cheerful in distributing them, compassionate and self-denying in the ministry of Christian mercy, especially to the household of faith. And beloved Christians, receive these brothers as servants of God, sustaining them with your daily prayers. Give the elders all honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord. Provide the deacons generally with the ne- generously with the necessary gifts for the needy, remembering the, that inasmuch as you do it to the least of these his children, you do it to him. May God give us to see in the ministry of the elders the supremacy of Christ, and in the ministry of the deacons the care and love of the Savior. Being thus engaged in your respective callings, each one of you shall receive of the Lord the reward of righteousness. Since we are unable of ourselves, let us call upon the name of the Lord in prayer. Our Lord God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have been pleased for the better edification of your church to appoint for her elders and deacons, besides the ministers of the word, by whom your church may be served in peace and prosperity and the needy assisted. We thank you for giving us in this place men who are of good testimony and by your promise endowed with your spirit. We ask you to provide them more and more with such gifts as are necessary for them in their service, with the gifts of wisdom, courage, discretion, benevolence, compassion, and self-denial, to the end that everyone may acquit himself as is becoming in his respective office. May the elders take great care of doctrine and life, in keeping out the wolves from the sheepfold of your beloved Son, and in admonishing and reproving disorderly persons. Likewise, the deacons, in carefully receiving gifts and generously and wisely distributing them to the needy and in comforting them with your holy word, give grace both to elders and deacons, that they may persevere in their faithful labor and never become weary by reason of any trouble, pain, or persecution of the world. Grant especially your divine grace to this people over whom they are placed, that they may willingly submit themselves to the good exhortations of the elders, counting them worthy of honor for their work's sake. Give unto the rich generous hearts towards the needy, and to the needy grateful hearts towards those who help and serve them. To the end that everyone acquitting himself of his duty, your holy name may thereby be magnified, and the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, enlarged. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on the new office bearers and their families. And we give thanks also for the outgoing office bearers, for the men who have served their term and who may now have a rest. We pray for them, Lord, for Brian and for Klaus, for Roger, for Adam, and for Eric. We thank you that you have enabled them to serve well and to rule well. We thank you, Lord, for the support of their families, their wives and children. We recognize that we do our work in the office, not alone, but with the help and care and prayer of our loved ones. And, Lord, we pray that you will bless them as they may rest and be refreshed. We thank you for all who may serve in one or another way as in the work of the Lord within the congregation. We thank you, Lord, that we may experience among ourselves each one doing his or her part, as your word says, and being knit together in love and being built up together in Christ. We recognize that that is a gift from on high, that that is a fruit of your Holy Spirit, that the communion of the saints is something that he works most of all. O Holy Spirit, we pray that you may continue to nourish the communion of the saints among us that we may share together in Christ, in all of His gifts and graces, and that we may share also in service one to another and in ministry to the world at large. We pray, Lord, for Your blessing on Your church, and we thank You for each one of the congregation. We pray for every family. We pray for every individual. We help those, O Lord, who have special needs. We be near to those who are under doctor's care. We provide for those who are not feeling well, whether older or younger, those who, whose lives are impacted by different frailties, 
and to experience weakness and who can be discouraged on account of it. Oh, Lord, please minister to them. Please refresh them. Please revive them and strengthen them in your sovereign way and will. We pray, Lord, too, for our children and for our young people. We pray that you will lead them and guide them in their life and that you will bless them with your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for young couples also, engaged couples, couples planning for marriage, and we pray for your blessing to be upon them. We pray for those who are single and would love to be married and who lay also those desires before you. Oh, Lord, will you provide also for them. We pray, Father, for unborn children, children in the womb, and especially we think of Scott and Stephanie Mebor with Stephanie's date for delivery very soon. We pray that you may make all things well for her and that you may give her strength for the delivery of the child and that you may bless the little one to be born. Grant, O oh Lord, to be born healthy and well. Grant, above all, to be born here, to be born again, to be born from the Spirit and from above. We pray that you may work in us and through us. Bless also all the ministry that we can do during the week, all the studies we can take part in, all the care and prayer we may utter for one another and show to one another. We pray that you may bless our witness that the world around us may know we are Christians by our love. Yes, help us in these days, O Lord. Help us to be a faithful church. Help us to be a wise and, and godly and holy church. Help us to be a light in the darkness all around us. Help us to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. And help us to run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. We pray, Lord, for the whole denomination to which we belong. And we commend to you every congregation, every consistory, every member and family. We, we pray, Lord, for every pastor, we pray especially for Pastor David Cranendonk, who has accepted the call of Grand Rapids to serve as professor, theological instructor to our students. Be with him and his family as they begin that transition. And with all of the, the challenges that may lay in the way still, Lord, will you provide, will you lead them, and will you guide them, and will you bless the work that he may do in this way for your church and for your kingdom. We pray too for Pastor John Prose and his family with the decision to which he has come also to accept the call to the Chilliwack HRC. Lord, bless this decision and go before Pastor Prose and his family and make all things well. And there where you have called him and where he will soon be installed, O oh Lord, will you anoint him with your spirit and will you strengthen him to proclaim Christ in all boldness and with your blessing. We pray for more laborers for the harvest. We pray, Lord, for the students at the seminary. We pray that we may have missionary hearts and that we may seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, that we may share also in the enthusiasm of the Apostle Paul as we could read that Christ may be preached to everyone. We pray that you will bless our gifts and our tithes and our offerings to that end. We cannot offer them, Lord, in the context of the worship service, but when we do give them, we pray that we may do so with worshiping hearts and that you will bless what we give and prosper abundantly what we give for the church, for the work of Elisha House, for all the many ministries that we may support, including Christian ministry to Israel, which we could offer for last week. We pray, O Lord, that you who don't need any of our funds may nevertheless use them in a great way that Christ may be lifted up and many may be drawn to Him and to find their life and their joy and their strength in Him, and that we ourselves would be a people who stay our minds on You and who enjoy that perfect peace that You promise to those who trust in You. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord with singing together from Psalter number 176. 100.
And 76 is a prayer to God for His blessing, but not just for our sake, but so that the nations may come to know the Lord our God. Let's sing all the stanzas of 176. Well, I invite you to turn again in your Bibles as I read the text for this afternoon's service once more. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, where we have the Word of God. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes we like to talk about what is our mission and passion in life. What are we really into? What gets us excited and motivated? What's, what's animating? What's driving us in our life? Mission and passion. Some people might say, in answer to that question, they might say, well, my family is my mission and passion, or my career, or my education, or maybe serving others is my mission and passion, or some particular hobby is my mission and passion. What would you say if someone asked you, what is your mission? What is your passion in life? Of course, our ultimate mission and passion ought to be to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Think here of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Everything, of course, should be subject to that great mission and passion. But then we start thinking about the details of our lives. How do I glorify God? How do I do so with the family He's given me, perhaps? 
or with the work that I have or the skills that I've been allowed to develop or the opportunities or the interests which, which have been also given to me, which God has put in my life. How do I praise God myself? We have to think about details. It's, it's good to do so and to be asking the Lord, like the Apostle Paul did when he was first converted, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So mission and passion is both general in that sense, glorify God and enjoy Him forever, and specific, doing so, each of us, uniquely in the details of our lives. And the same is not only true for individuals and all Christians, but it is also so for the church as a whole. Mission and passion is both general and specific. Our chief purpose as congregation is to glorify God. That's why we exist. Our calling is to worship the God of heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And unless we do so, we miss our calling, we miss our mission, and we have misdirected passion. But can we, can we be any more detailed? So glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Is there anything more specific in terms of what should be our mission and our passion? And it is here that our text is helpful, isn't it? Because Paul, in, one, in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, Paul is laying out what is to be one of the missions and passions of the church of Jesus Christ. Every congregation, everywhere. Him we preach, says Paul, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Isn't Paul telling us here what is to be the mission and passion of every faithful Christian congregation, that we preach Christ to every man. Yes, to every man we preach Christ. So there are two things there, really. One is we're to preach Christ. Him we preach. That's to be our mission. He's to be our theme. He's to be the great passion of our proclamation. Whatever else we are about, whatever else we do, this we must do. Bring the message of Jesus Christ. But second, we don't just preach Christ to some people or to select people. No, ultimately we're to be concerned, we're to be consumed with preaching Him to all people. Doesn't the text make a point of that? Three times in verse 28, three times saying, preach to every man, to every man, to every man. And then we think of how Christ Himself taught this shortly before His ascension. For instance, in Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus said to His disciples, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. So Paul is simply echoing that great commission and saying this is to be our mission and our passion, preaching Christ to every man. And Paul is expressing that, and then Paul also tells how he himself is personally involved in that. That's verse 29 when he says, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So it is the church's mission and passion, and Paul is saying, as member of the church, and as an apostle in the church, Paul is saying he is fully on board. Well, here we are in an installation service, and five new office bearers are about to take their place among us as elders and deacons. And isn't this a good time to remind ourselves what is to be our mission and what is to be our passion? And it's for all of us as congregation. And are we on board with this? And likewise for you as office bearers, together with all the others, this is what God is calling you to oversee and to promote and to execute, that we be a church, that we be a people earnestly committed to carrying out this mission and this passion. Here in the sanctuary in a formal way, through corporate and public worship, but also through our individual life and testimony and as families and as people in this world, including all that we support and promote. Christ, we preach to every man. That's it. And let's reflect for a few moments then in view of our text on this theme. Christ, we preach 
to every man. First of all, as you can see in the bulletin, the points are what way, what for, and what with. First of all, what way? Christ, we preach to everyone what way? Well, from our text, we can say a number of things. One, notice the word preach. Him we preach. That's a very specific word. It means to announce, to declare, to proclaim. So we preach, we preach Christ through announcing Him, declaring Him, proclaiming Him. We need to say to people, there is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, the Holy One. We need to say that. And there's an emphasis here on speaking with our mouth, with our mouth, with our words, bringing a message. We shouldn't miss this or ever forget this. Sometimes people talk about being missionaries with their lives, witnesses with their lives. Of course, that's a biblical theme that's very important. Our, our, our words and our life should come together and, and together be, be a powerful commendation of the gospel. But it should never be our lives apart from our words. And this is important to emphasize. Also in our day, we, we live in a day in, in, in the context of the church at large and worship where, where there's always temptation to compromise on this point. And where it can be thought that the church is about getting together and, and fellowshipping and nurturing personal reflections and practicing meditation, other things. Or, or maybe in terms of doing social justice and community service. And these are the things that should define the church. And so easily these things can, can overtake what is to be the proclamation of the message. And the message is somehow stifled and stuffed away and lost. Meanwhile, it's the one thing that should never, ever, ever be forsaken. Him we preach. The sermon matters. The sermon matters. And more than anything else. We have a message to proclaim and a Savior to declare. But let's see more in the text. Him we preach, so with our mouth proclaiming Him. But then Paul says, warning every man and teaching every man. So warning and teaching. With these two verbs, Paul gives us further details in terms of what way we are to preach Christ to every man. We don't just announce Him, but we warn and we teach. And both verbs are very important. We warn. That means that we tell people they are sinners under judgment and they need to turn back to the Lord. We need to explain to people what is wrong with all of us as human beings. We need to explain that and we need to say to them, what we have to do is to repent. We have to return to the Lord our God. We have to go to Him on our knees. We have to seek mercy and grace with Him or else we will die. We will go to hell. We have to warn. We have to speak to people in their sin, in their rebellion. We have to confront them. We have to say to them sometimes, the way you are living is not right. The way you are born into this world is not right. It is not safe to keep going down this path that you're on. It will not lead to life. We have to help people understand that judgment is coming to this world. And all of us, every single human being, will be compelled to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we must give account of ourselves. And if we are living in sin and living in service to Satan, as we all are by nature, if we are doing so when judgment comes, oh, how heavy, how horrible that will be. We have to warn, Paul says, warning every man. What do we think of that? It's not so easy, is it? Who likes to warn people? Who likes to be the negative voice in the conversation? Who dares to say the truth that is awkward and embarrassing maybe and even very unpopular? And what about if we risk being despised or rejected or mocked or persecuted in some way. We'd rather not warn if we can help it. But Paul says this is part of the preaching. Him we preach, warning every man. 
But not only warning, there is also teaching. If warning is about calling people to repentance, speaking to their heart, and teaching is about helping them to believe, directing people to the Savior, to put their trust in Him, to go to Him, and so to follow Him, that's teaching. Of course, teaching and warning are in many ways interconnected, but we teach especially when we say to people in their sin and guilt, listen, look to Jesus Christ. We teach people when we tell them about Him, about how He is God and man, about how He is the Word become flesh, and we, we have seen His glory, we can see it in the gospel. We teach when we recount His life, His ministry, His miracles, His message. We teach when we point people to His suffering on the cross, how he was suffering as sin bearer. We teach when we say to them, like Isaiah prophesied, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. We teach when we pass on his invitation to come to him and to find rest in him. We teach when we explain that Jesus receives sinners and he saves them. And everyone who comes to him, he never casts out. All that is teaching. It's teaching. And likewise, it's teaching, isn't it, when we help people understand that in coming to Jesus Christ, we're to follow Him. Because He doesn't just forgive us, He transforms us. He works to wash us and to cleanse us and purify us. He seeks to change our life. And so we're to walk in His ways, and, and we ought to, and we truly want to, and we can even when He enables us through His Holy Spirit to hear His words and by means of His power and grace, to begin to keep His commandments. That's teaching. And all of that is part of preaching Christ. We announce Him, we declare Him, we proclaim Him, and especially we warn and we teach. Teaching, too, is not always so easy. It means we have to understand the truth. We have to keep learning the truth. We have to grow in our own comprehension of it. Teaching work involves also being very patient, patient with people. And the biblical model of teaching, line upon line upon line upon line. And time after time, we have to come alongside people and remind them and refocus them and redirect them. And we have to say, this is the way. Don't you remember? This is the way. Come, let's walk in this way. And then something else still under this point of what way. What way we preach Christ to everyone. Notice in verse 28 that little phrase, in all wisdom. So we announce, declare, proclaim, we warn and teach. All that is the way we preach Christ to everyone, but let's not forget that we're to do it in all wisdom. What does that mean? Doesn't it mean that in all our preaching and witnessing, in all our work as church, as office bearers, as confessing, confessing Christians. And in all our work, we're to be so thoughtful and prayerful and particular. We're to reflect an understanding of the gospel and how to, how to present it and what to emphasize and to minister according to people's needs and according to the time and place. Sometimes the law needs to be stressed. Sometimes the gospel Many times both. Sometimes we have to warn especially. Other times teach. Again, many times both. Sometimes it's Christ as Savior we especially emphasize. Sometimes it's Christ as Lord. Again, many times both. And to do all of that and to do it well. What wisdom. What wisdom we need. That's exactly what wisdom is all about. In all wisdom. So this is what way? Preaching Christ to every man. Let's just pause here and think about the question, if this is what it means, if this is the way we are to do it, what are the implications for us as office bearers and as congregation? Well, isn't one thing that we commit a new, never to compromise or abandon the faithful preaching of the Word of God. 
Let us continue to insist on the proclamation, the faithful proclamation of the message of the gospel being the very centerpiece of our worship and of the, the witness of our congregation. The very centerpiece. And here we can say that we all have a particular task. As office bearers, together with the whole consistory, the Lord calls you men to guard and preserve and promote and enable the preaching of His Word. As elders, you serve to oversee the preaching and to hold it to the high standard of the Word of God. As deacon, you serve to oversee the service work of the church so that the pastor and elders can focus on the preaching of the Word of God. Because we all together understand that that preaching is what is all important. It's important here in the sanctuary, it's important in the witness that we do in the world. And what about as congregation? Do we not all have the responsibility to expect, to expect faithful preaching and to require it? And likewise to pray for it and then also to receive it and to submit to it and all the time also to support it and promote it. And let the result be that whatever else we are known for, and we may be known for many good things, and there is no harm in that, but whatever else, let this be the chief thing, that we are a church, together with many others, we are a church that preaches Christ to everyone, announcing Him, declaring Him, proclaiming Him, warning and teaching, and doing so in all wisdom. That's our mission and our passion. Well, that's what way. What about what for? Our second point. Preaching Christ to everyone, what for? Here we look at the end of verse 28. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So that is what for. We preach Christ to every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So what is in view here is handing over to God at the end of their earthly life, handing over to Him, presenting them, the people of God to Him, and, and presenting them to Him in, in such a way that they are as thoroughly Christian as can be, that they are mature Christian. That, that is the point with the phrase, perfect in Christ Jesus. It, it doesn't mean, it can't mean sinless. We know that because it is not possible to be sinless in this life. Sin is with us till our dying day. Every Christian will struggle to one degree or another. Till their last breath, every Christian will be engaged in a warfare with sin. So it's not about no more sin, but it is about no more living in sin. It is about learning better and faster to repent of every known sin and to appropriate the forgiveness of God in Christ through faith in Him. It is about learning to put off the old nature and instead to put on the new nature. It is about looking less and less like a sinner and more and more like a saint through the transforming power of Christ and His gospel and by the Holy Spirit. Maybe we can just linger on this point for a moment and ask ourselves the question, is this the way that we understand what it means to be a Christian? Do we realize and reflect that we realize that to be a Christian is so much more than to be a brand plucked from the fire, as it were, rescued from the burning? It's so much more than not having to go to hell, as great as that is, or looking forward to going to heaven. To be a Christian is about learning a whole new way of life. To be a Christian is, is to grow up in the Lord Jesus Christ learning to think like Him and to speak like Him and to live like Him. Is this not what the Bible teaches? That we be conformed to the image of the Son of God so that we increase in faith and we increase in love and we increase in holiness and righteousness. What should be in the life of every Christian 
What should be is that you start to make progress in the obedience that God requires of you. Though you will experience that you make so little progress from your own perspective. That's true. The, the, the more we grow, the more we see how much we have to grow. The more we start to learn to obey, the more we see how little we do obey and how much we disobey. That's all true. For every step forward, it can seem like we take two steps back so many times. And yet for the sake of the Savior who loved us and gave Himself for us, isn't it true that when you're a growing Christian, you love Him and you want to give yourself to Him and to serve Him? Surely this, what it, this is what it means to be or what it means to be, start becoming perfect in Christ Jesus, that we trust Him more and more and seek to reflect Him more and more. And when we don't, we grieve over that more and more. And we pray to Him more and more for grace to live as He calls us to live. Well, this is what Paul is thinking of when he speaks about presenting every man perfect in Christ Jesus presenting every sinner who trusts in Jesus, so clinging, so holding fast to the Savior. They can't ever do without Him, and they want Him, and they will live for Him, and they will reflect Him. Every man, perfect, must be our aim, our mission, and our passion, that all the time that we spend together, and this whole period of life that we share together, that this is the grand result, that we are getting closer and closer at least striving to, aspiring to, likeness to Jesus Christ. We should want that as a church, especially as office bearers. Here's our task, personally, of course, and also what we want to promote and encourage, the vision, the mission, and the passion to which we give ourselves to see everyone perfect in Christ Jesus. Again, as office bearers, what a holy challenge this is. As elders, as you do your work, as you visit the people, as you listen and converse and give oversight, sometimes that includes also the exercise of discipline. But always remember, this is the aim, to see the whole church perfect in Christ Jesus. And as deacon in your responsibilities, providing care for the members and helping to administrate mercy and love, always this ought to be in view to see people perfect in Christ Jesus, growing, maturing in Him. And all of us as consistory, we're to seek this for the congregation, and we're to think even beyond the congregation. Every man, every man. Oh, how our hearts ought to, ought to be with care and concern for those who live around us, for those who walk in darkness, for those who do not know the way, the truth, and the life. That is why our mission and passion needs to be to preach Christ, to present every man perfect in Him. Well, if we think of this, it can be very daunting. One thing, no doubt, is that it requires work. And Paul writes about that in verse 29 when he says, To this end I also labor. And he talks on about striving. And so the work of the church and the work of the office bearers, and this extends in a way to every Christian, but it's meant to be work, hard work. I labor, says Paul. And that's a word that means something like I toil to the point of exhaustion. We need to be clear about this. The work of the office will call for a lot from you. It is different than the work of a tradesman or a laborer, it's not manual work as such. It's not work that may be so hard on your body. It's different. It's mental work. It's spiritual work. It means nights out, sometimes late nights. Sometimes that can be a burden for families, for, fam for wives and children. And they have to bear that. And we bear it for them and with them. We need to be mindful and be balanced. But there is a cost, and there is a sacrifice to be made, and that's simply the way it is. But then, too, the work means doing all we can to keep track of people and to get to know people, to understand people. It means bearing the, the burden of the souls of the people and praying much over them 
thinking about ways to reach them and to engage them, to help them, to counsel them, to follow through with them. Sometimes it means investing in people and being disappointed when they stumble and fall, when they walk away. It means having to be patient and time after time returning to the Lord and seeking for His intervention and all the time not giving in to discouragement, keeping up joy in the Lord for our own selves. It's work to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul speaks elsewhere about being spent in the work. In fact, it's work so great that in ourselves we cannot do it. No one can. You can't. I can't. We can't together. As a congregation, we can't. I'm sure you men have some sense of that. As much as you recognize the call of God in your life, you also no doubt have a sense of trembling, a sense of weakness, an awareness that you are not sufficient. To be part of this effort to preach Christ to every man, as Paul describes, truly, who can do it? As a congregation, as individuals, we have to acknowledge we can't. But confessing that, let's be helped and encouraged by the last thing in our text. And the last point for this afternoon. Christ we preach to every one. What way, what for, and what with. Look at verse 29. To this end I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. So Paul is saying, I'm working. But I'm only succeeding because of His working, which works in me mightily. This, by the way, is true for Christian parents, Christian teachers, Christian missionaries, Christian office bearers, everyone. We work, but we only succeed because He works in and through us. So we do the work of preaching Christ to everyone. And we do it the way Paul describes, and we ought to, and we need to commit to that and be faithful in that. But we do it, Paul is saying, And we succeed in it solely and entirely because of the strength that the Lord Himself continually works in us. No other way. And on the one hand, it's it's a lesson to us. And at the same time, it's so encouraging to us. According to His working, which works in me mightily. So Paul is working, but Paul is saying Christ is working. I'm preaching Him and He's always working. I'm striving and He's always striving. And His striving is mighty. His striving is powerful. He works in me mightily, mightily. Yes, how does He do that? Well, He must be strengthening the faith of His people. Isn't that part of His mighty work? When He strengthens our faith, when He strengthens our mind, and when He strengthens our heart, when He strengthens our love, when He strengthens our zeal, when He strengthens our resolve, He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. And this power comes from on high. This power comes through the crucified and risen Christ. This power is great power. It is exalted heavenly power. And it comes to us through reliance on Him. It comes to us by way of the Holy Spirit. And it comes through the Word of God. And what this means, therefore, is that we must seek to fulfill this mission and passion. We must explicitly seek to fulfill it, not in our own strength, but in His strength. That is why, brothers, in many ways, our greatest responsibility is prayer. Lord, help me to serve You. Help me to fulfill my office. Help us to preach Christ to everyone. To announce Him and proclaim Him and declare Him. To warn and to teach in all wisdom. And to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Probably our greatest calling is to be men of prayer. Men who are often with the Lord. Individually and together 
men who pour out our hearts to God and seek His wisdom, His grace, His strength, His power. In this respect, if we think of Paul, he was especially a praying man. Just in this chapter that we read, Colossians 1, he referred to it a number of times. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Then he himself say to all Christians, pray without ceasing. Think of the apostles too as they were getting established in their ministry. They said, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Because prayer is first. Because it is through prayer that we can do the ministry that God has given to us. And given that, isn't it fair to say that the more we pray, all the more this mission and passion will be reflected in our lives. Don't just embrace the mission and passion. Embrace it on your knees. Let us commit to prayer above all else as office bearers. We, are, we do seek to be men of prayer, but let us recommit to it and as congregation, commit to prayer for your office bearers, for us as congregation, for the work we have been given to do as church. Even in these days of challenge, let us commit to prayer. O God, to us show mercy, he sang, and bless us in thy grace. Cause thou to shine upon us the brightness of thy face, that so thy way most holy on earth may soon be known, and unto every people thy saving grace be shown. As we pray, who knows what great ways the Lord will come and work in us and through us, even so that many sons and daughters may be born in Zion, brought to perfection in Christ Jesus, and ushered into eternal glory. That fruit, of course, is up to Him. But when our mission and our passion are aligned with God's Word, that is what we long to see. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord our God, help us that we may, here in Vineland FRC, be faithful to this mission and passion as it has been reflected already for many years, and we are conscious this afternoon that we are heirs of generations of faithfulness by your grace. But we must carry on. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We bless these new office bearers together with all, with all the office bearers that we may Follow after the example of Paul, striving, laboring in this work, but doing so according to your working, which works in us mightily. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us as a church and glorify your name in us and through us. We do not know what the days ahead will bring, but you know. And we pray that we may be faithful in our calling, and we pray that there may be many, even in our community and beyond, who are born again in Zion, who are brought to know the living God, who are made to be perfect in Christ Jesus. Indeed, we pray that for ourselves, all of us, individually, as families. We pray, Lord, for our children and for our young people. We pray for your covenant work, your converting work in their life. Early, may they remember you. May they be satisfied with your mercy. And may they rejoice and be glad all their days. And we pray that for us all. Thank you again, Lord, that we can have this service. We couldn't have it last Sunday, but you have enabled us to have it today. We pray that our worship may have been acceptable in your sight. And soon the Lord's day will be over and the work of the week will begin. And we commend to you our work, our students, our children and their studies those who go out of the home to work, and those who work in the home. And Lord, we pray that you will provide for our daily needs, that you will give us wisdom for all things, that you will strengthen us and bless us, and that we may be faithful to you. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you may come quickly, even as you have promised, and that till then we may be steadfast and endure. Forgive our sins even in worship and hear our prayer 
For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing Psalter number will be 238. And our doxology will be 196. 238 and 196. Let us, though, at this time, rise to confess our faith. We join the church of many ages and places with the words of the Apostles' Creed in confessing what it is we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord and go to your homes and into this week in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.